Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. And it reads in this wise, it says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. When we look at this passage of Scripture, actually in Ephesians <clears throat> chapter 5 and verse 16, really when you look at, in, look at it and examine it in the King James Version, the King James uses the word redeeming the time. But the ESV really has the best fit when it says making the best use of time. They, they both mean the same thing, but it's, it is important for us to understand that, that it falls our lot and it befalls us to do exactly what Jesus said, what Paul inspired, uh, 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 what, what the Lord inspired Paul to write is that we are to redeem the time, make the best use of time. What's interesting is that as you begin to study the Word of God, <clears throat> when you look at it in its scope and its sequence, when you watch it, analyze it, study it, and receive it in its length and its breadth, one of the things that, that really there's a scarlet thread that runs through, through the canon of Scripture, and that scarlet thread is this, time sensitivity. You look at the Bible in its scope, in its makeup, in its sequence, it focuses on the proper use of time. Time after time, from Old Testament to New Testament, time is always vitally important. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, talks about the fact that to everything there is a season, there is a time, there is a purpose under the heavens. When you go to Galatians chapter 4, I believe it is verse 4. Paul talks about the fact on the arrival of Jesus. Listen to what he says. When the fullness of time did come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem us, buy us back, bring us back, purchase us back from up under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Yeah, that, that's the arrival of Christ. But we not only see the arrival of Christ, John, I think it's 9 and 4, now tells us about the work of Christ. He, it was Jesus. It's John who records the words of our Christ who says that I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. For the word of the Lord avows, for when the night cometh, no man can work. Isaiah 55 and 6 talks about the fact we are admonished and encouraged to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. What's the point? The point to be made is this, is that when we look at the scope and sequence, the length and breadth of Scripture, time is always valuable. Time is one of our most precious commodity. Well, when we come here to Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, it's important for us to understand that he hits on this uh, uh, just Briefly, and if we're not careful, we will actually miss uh, the, 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 the power of this one verse found here in Ephesians chapter 5. Well, what's amazing is that as you begin to look at the breakdown of the text, it focuses on several things leading up to verse 16. Verse 1 through verse 6 deals with the fact that as Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, he's writing for them to, 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 to walk in, in the love of God's Word. It's a walk of love is what he talks about. Verses 7 through 14 is to walk in the light. We're to walk in love in verse 1 through 6. We're to walk in light in verses 7 through 14. Then we're to walk in wisdom in verse 15. He tells us that our walk should be one of being circumspect. We must govern our deportment. At the end of the chapter, he focuses on basic admonitions, really in marriage, telling us how we should conduct ourselves, our walk in our family setting. But then uh, amid the walk of love, the walk of light, the walk of wisdom, and also the walk in our relationships, he, he, he gives us, 
He gives us a challenge and he gives us an admonition that in all of this walking that we should do. He says, now one of the things that you got to do amid walking in the light, amid walking in love, amid having wisdom, uh, amid uh, operating properly in your marital, your conjugal relationship, he said, one thing you got to do amid doing all of that, you got to learn to make the best use of your time. You have to redeem the time. And so as we look at the text, just, just a few things I want to give you when it comes to how do we make the best use of our time? How do we redeem the time? How, how, how do we get the maximum amount of, of energy for the efforts that we're putting? How do we see the greatest dividend as being believers, as being blood-bought and born again and raisers of the blood-stained banner? How do we do that? We, we got to make the best use of our time. First thing we see from the text is this. Paul admonishes us, and, and, and I want you to see this. He wants us to use what we have. That's the first thing. If I'm going to make the best use of my time as a Christian, if we're going to make the best use of our time as believers, if we're going to make the best use of our time of those that, that have been called out of darkness and called into the marvelous light, there, there, there's one thing we got to do. We got to learn to use what we have. And in using what we have, there, there, there are two things on that. First of all, you got to be disciplined. If we're going to use what we have, we have to learn to exhibit and exemplify discipline, but not just discipline, but we've got to learn to be deliberate. Make, make the best use. Make the best use of your time. Be, be deliberate. Not only be deliberate, be disciplined. That's how you use what you have. Here it is. Here it is. Notice he says in the text, making the best use of the time. In other words, re 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 redeem, redeem the time. Paul is not just saying this from a spiritual premise. He's also using it from an experiential premise. Get that. This is, not, this is not just spiritual verbiage and spiritual jargon. It is both spiritual and experiential. How do you come up with that spiritual and experiential? Keep in mind that all Scripture is given by God, is inspired by God. It, yeah, it, it, it's man, it's God-breathed and man-written. It's, and so when he tells us to make the best use of our time, he's telling us to do that on behalf of what God has instructed him to do. But check this, in, check this out. It's not just spiritual. It's also experiential. My God, get that. Because keep in mind that the backdrop of this text, where Paul, listen, Ephesians is known it is in the genre of writing of what is known as prison epistles. Get that. Get that. Prison epistles. Paul is on lockdown. Paul is in confinement. Paul is in jail. He does not have the mobility that he once had. He does not have the freedom that he once had. He does not have the opportunity to come. The ebb and flows of his life are restricted and constrained because this, when he writes this epistle, he is under, this is his first arrest in Rome, in house arrest in Rome. Paul is on lockdown. But here's the thing that I love about him. When he's saying, that, listen, we have to redeem the time, he's saying, really, make the best use of time. Get this. And as you make the best use of time, one of the things that we've got to stop doing is that as God gives us opportunities, we've got to stop giving God excuses pertaining to why we can't use what we have. Yeah, you got to stop giving God. I know it. I know it. I know it. You got rheumatoid arthritis. I know it. You got this. I know it. You got that. I know it. Your own dialysis, I get it. I'm on dialysis three days a week here. When God gives you an opportunity, we're going to redeem the time, make the best use of our time. And as we make the best use of our time, we make the best use of our times in light of who has called us out of darkness and who has called us into the marvelous light and pertaining to who our Savior and our employer is. And if we're going to make the best use of time, when God gives you an opportunity, stop giving God an excuse. 
Here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. Paul is in jail. Can't come and go like he normally is able to come and go. The ebbs and flows of his life are confined and restricted. But here it is. While he is in jail, he makes the best use of his time by taking a pen, taking some parchment, begin to write to encourage uh, uh, three different churches and one person. He encourages Philemon because he writes that during the time that he writes this letter. He encourages the Galatians church, the Galatian church. He encourages, listen, the Ephesians church. He encourages the Colossians church. Where does he do it? He does it in the confines of a jail. In other words, God was not judging him for what he could not do. God was judging him for what he could do. So therefore, the next time that you are on dialysis, tell the technician about Jesus. The next time you're on dialysis, the next time you get on the bus to go to the dialysis, ask somebody, can you pray for them? Ask them, listen, is there anything that I can lift to the throne of grace on your behalf? Whatever you have at your discretion, use it at your discretion. Oh, if you are coaching little leagues, invoke Jesus' name when you bring them in and ask them, let's pray before the game and pray after the game. What is Paul challenging us to do? He is challenging us to use what we have. Here it is, but in order to use what you have, you got to be disciplined, but you also have to be ah, deliberate. James 1 and 8 says this, that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. But it's not just a double-minded man who's unstable in all of his ways. Is also an undisciplined man. He says, listen, what I need you to do, I need you, I need you, mm, I need you to make the best use of time. I got to get off of this. As I make the best use of time, I use what's at my discretion. And what I can do is that I can start. Charity does begin at home. Yeah, it, it begins at home. Uh, it, it, charity begins not only at your church. Charity begins in your house which means that whatever I'm a part of, I need to be disciplined enough to be dedicated to it. Whatever I sign up for, I need to serve. I need to identify what my challenges are, what my gifts are, on and so forth. And what I need to do, I need to serve in that capacity. I need to be disciplined enough. I need to take the Word of God and the work of God and put it on my schedule, and then I need to make it a daily part of my life. I need to ask God, how can we get glory? Because if we don't begin to discipline ourselves, I believe that one of our greatest, one of our greatest success will ultimately become our our greatest failure in the fact that we have built and we've built a wonderful church and we've built a nice church on and so forth. But the challenge is, is that if we don't become more disciplined in helping our children to understand the importance of the Word of God, they're going to be two tombstones if we ain't careful once we die. There's going to be our own tombstone. But then right next to us, kind of spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically, there's going to be the tombstone of the church. Because what's going to happen if we ain't careful? The church will die with us. We've got to be disciplined. We've got to be disciplined. We, we th thank God for the academics of our kids. Thank God for the sports in our kids' life. Thank God for our kids being cultured. I believe they need all of that. You need the academics because you got to learn. you got to know something. Amen. Because people pay you for what you know and when you don't know nothing, they pay you no attention. You got to learn something. You got to have something in your head. You need sports. I'm not against sports. I love sports. And I think sports, whether or not somebody plays on Sunday or not, or whether they make it professional or not, this is what sports, it teaches discipline. It teaches teamwork. It teaches how to get along. It teaches collaboration. We need the arts. We need to have our children cultured. You got to learn more than just knowing what's on your iPhone and this, that, and the other. You need to know something about the Renaissance. You need to know something about your history. You need to know something about the Byzantine time. You, you need to be cultured. But, but, but to have the discipline, to have the academics, to have the culture, and not to have the Christ. Here, listen, listen, listen. We've got to leave one of the things that we do not want is for once we die, the church dies with us. And what's crazy is this, is that our children make twice as much as we do. They know twice as much as we do. 
they, they earn twice as much as we do. They have more affluence than we do. But you know what the challenge is? When it comes to life's most crucial problems, they oftentimes have to borrow from our faith because they don't have faith enough on their own. That's because we didn't discipline them. Yeah, make them come to church. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you make them go to school. Yeah, yeah you don't have, I don't feel like going. I'm not going. No, you're going to get your, uh, yeah, you, you got to make him. You got to make him. Yeah, he, does, he signed up for the team. No, son, you can't quit. No, baby, you can't quit. We, we, we make them learn. Why, why is it? Because those things are essential. And it's not until we discipline them in a manner that they understand that faith is equally as important. I'm spending too much time on this, or more important. But then not only that, you not only got to be, you not only have to be disciplined, but you have to be deliberate. What, what, what do you mean deliberate? You, you, we as well as our kids, redeeming the time, make the best use of what you got. One of the things we can't do, one of the things we can't do, we cannot have an emergency. We're raising a group of young people who only have an emergency room response to Jesus. Yeah, yeah, we only come to him. I'm in crisis. I need my bills paid. This is happening. I'm under duress. Listen, people who only go to the hospital, listen, in emergency cases, typically don't have a physician. Because there's something that you need to understand that if you got a physician, if you have a doctor, there are times you don't have to go to the emergency room because as long as you are seeing and meeting with the physician, guess what? He helps you through those low moments of, of life. It's one of the things we got to do if we're going to redeem the time, if we're going to make the best use of our time. Charity got to begin at home. We've got to be disciplined. And we've got to be deliberate. That's what Paul is speaking to when he says, listen, make, make, make the best use of time. Make the best use of time. When we make the best use of time, what we have to do is that we have to show Christ in our family. When we make the best use of time, we have to show Christ in our finances. When we make the best use of time, we have to show that Christ, you can have fun in Jesus. The, the problem is, is that if you cannot show your children you know the world, a joyful God, a joyful Savior, the joy that Jesus brings if you live a depressed Christian life. Got to make the best use of our time. Use what you have. He says, listen, make, make the best use of time. Make, making the best use of time because, listen to this, the days are evil. The whole emphasis on verse 16 Focus on the last five to six words because the days. That, that, that's the reason we make the best use of time, because the days are evil. How do we make the best use of time? Point number two, understand time is a gift with an expiration. Understand that time is a gift. Understand, understand that time is making the best use of time. Time is a gift with, 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 with an expiration, and with that being said, you, you don't have the luxury of doing nothing, and then you got to remove some of the claims of life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, understand that time, time is a gift. Time is a gift. Time is a gift with expiration. I'm always afraid of people who waste time because Time is too precious, yeah, to, 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 to be wasted. I, I hear people sometimes ask, do you have any spare time? Now, uh that, <laughs> you don't, no time, glory to God, is spare time. I, I hear people who get behind who say, listen, I'm going to make up time. No, no, brother, no, no, sister. You can never make up time because whatever time you lost is time that cannot be gained. Time comes with, yeah, understand that time comes. Don't exploit it mm, because it comes with, 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 with an expiration. You, we don't have the luxury of, of not doing anything. This is the crazy thing. This, you, we don't have the luxury of not doing anything. Make the best use as a church. Make the best use of time. How, how do, I, how do I, I, I make the best use of time? I make the best use of time by, by understanding by understanding that I must do more, but while I'm doing more, 
I cannot continue to survive doing the same thing. Wow. I, I got to do more. Redeem the time. Make the best use. Make the best use. <laughs> time is a precious commodity. If we can't, we, we, we shouldn't waste it. It, it. It's not to be spared. But, but we've got to understand, we've got to understand that doing nothing is not an option. I, I can't be to a place if I'm going to make the best use of the time that I have for Jesus. If I'm going to make the best use of the time that I have for Jesus, I have to be to a point that I understand it's the duality of life. I can't, as successful perhaps as we have been, I can't just continue to be comfortable, complacent, and common with doing the same thing on one end and then be at a place where I do absolutely nothing. <laughs> Get this. See, sometimes... One of my friends, Santana, told me this a few weeks ago. Blew my mind. I, matter of fact, as he was talking, I said, man, say it again because I got to write it down. He said, Pastor Williams, I want to tell you, one of the things that the pandemic did was it saved the church. I thought he was a little bit off. <laughs> you know, we, we all trying to survive. We, you know, we, we running, we masked up. I mean, right now, you know, when I leave the stage, I wear three masks now. If you find me passed out, it's not because I got COVID. It's because I just can't breathe because I, I just wish I had some help here. I got an air purifier in my office. I mean, I'm, I, if you stay two minutes long, I'm going to point the air purifier at you. I'm just, because that's just where I am now. You know, so, but, but he, he says, he says, he says, Pastor, COVID, say, I said, man, that's, what do you mean Santana saved the church? He said, Pastor, it saved the church, he says, because it made the church keep up with the times. I said, my God. He said, it made the church. And he was telling the truth because we have gone from 35% of our, the body of our membership given online to 85%. That, that's, that's a lot of folk who, who never would, you know, say that the, the you know, electronic stuff is the devil. It's them group of folk that, that now, they, and, and, and then some of them have the gall to try to text me, Pastor, this is easy. I told you it was easy a long time ago. You just wish I had some help here. Here, here it is. And then now, we, we, did, we, did, we, we did the other day, a couple of weeks ago, I met with all of the leadership, and I was just amazed of all of the body of believers of our membership who was on Zoom. And then some of them know how to not only get on Zoom, but then take the picture off and take the sound off, and just, they just got a picture. There. I said, now look at here. <laughs> Talking about <laughs> catching up, and what Santa Tana told me was true. The pandemic forced the church to, it did two things. First of all, it exposed the church, but then it compelled the church to keep up with the times. Something is wrong if the only thing that we have learned coming out of a pandemic is how to get on Zoom. Something is wrong. If the only thing that we've learned from a pandemic is how to give a contribution online. What are you saying? We cannot afford as the church to wait until another pandemic occurs to make us catch up with time once again. What do you mean? You got to redeem the time. And in order to redeem the time, you got to redeem your mind. You buy a new car, you got to think new when it comes to advancing the kingdom. You purchase a new house. You got to think new when it comes to trying to redeem our youth. When it comes to you wanting a new coat, a new coat, a new suit, a new dress, you ain't wearing that stuff back in the 70s. They'll laugh you to scorn. You know what you do? You look for what's fresh. You look for what's popping. How is it that innovation is relegated to the world and not the church? We've got to redeem the time. 
We got to redeem the time. You got to redeem the time. You got to understand that time is a gift mm, with expiration. Yeah, we, we won't have the luxury of not doing anything. And we got to remove some claims. Man, I got to pick up some time on this. Listen, there's a reason why Oldsmobile went out of business. There's a reason. There's a reason. Matter of fact, just before they went out of business, they tried to rebrand themselves. How do you rebrand yourself using the same name, Oldsmobile? Think about it. Think about it. That's all. Oxy, you, you're trying to be new when old is in your name. I don't mean, but you can't be fresh talking about we the primitive church. You can't be fresh talking about we're colonial. That does not. The, <laughs> names have meaning. Name, your name is your brand. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. Your Oldsmobile. Matter of fact, one of the commercials they came up with just before they went out of business, this is not your father's Oldsmobile. Well, you still got the old name in it. 2004, after being in business 106 years, all of a sudden they went out of business. You know why they went out of business? Because they didn't know how to attract the new and they insulted the old. What do you mean? It was old folk. I mean, senior people that was buying Oldsmobile. And now the very people that's buying it, you telling them this, <laughs> this is not your car. This is okay. So what you did was you drove them away. And then the mere fact that you kept old in the name did not attract any new people. What's the point? The point is, is that, man, you got to work every angle you got. You got to work the seniors. You got to work the young people. You got to work the middle age. You got to work those who are broken. You got to work those who are divorced. You got to work those who are struggling with their idea. You got to work every angle. You cannot be monolithic. You got to preach the gospel. You got to redeem those who are broken. Why call your name Hope Well if you ain't offering no hope? Make the best use. You, you, can't, you can't be in the thing not, not, not doing anything and just doing the same thing. But then there are some claims that you must remove. I keep trying to wind this up. There are some claims you got to remove. Every day, something is putting a claim on you and I, a claim on your time a claim on your energy, a claim on your knowledge, a claim on your intelligence. And there's nothing wrong with that because now sometimes in order to get where God has called us to be, listen, you, some things place a claim on you and when they place that claim on you, sometimes you, you, you got to pony up. If you're trying to make it in corporate America, the, the, Got to put a claim on you. If you're trying to, you're going up in rank in the military, puts a claim on you. That life, all life places claims on us. Here's our challenge. We're going to redeem our time for Jesus, redeem, redeem our time for Christ. One of the things that we've got to do is that we've got to learn to pay off some of the liens that are on us. Because if we don't begin to pay off some of the liens that are on us, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and psychologically, then what's going to happen is that our most precious commodities will be left in the pawn shop of life. And we'll wonder why the world is not changing. The world won't change because world changers are not changing the world. The world won't change. You're a world changer. You know, if, if you have a son or a daughter, you're a world changer. If you have a grandson or granddaughter, you are a world changer. If you have a niece or a nephew, a brother or a sister, you're a world changer. And the problem is, is that we're not investing in what's home and we wonder why the world is not changing. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. Something is wrong if you're looking for things to be better in this world, but you've never sowed a good seed. That, that, that's ludicrous. You want to reap where you didn't sow? Sow in your own house. <laughs> Bible says that we're to bring them up. I, I know, I know, yeah, we, you know, church can't do it all. You got to do your part. We have to do our part. But then 
if you act like you're bored with church, <laughs> come on. I know, I know, and sometimes we don't hit it all. Sometimes I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm not, the, sometimes we miss it as, as leaders and as pastors, we miss it. But the thing you got to do is that you got to help us in the process because you can't just put it on us and just leave it for us to do. You got to do it. Yeah, I know sometimes you got some guys are good, some guys not so good, some guys kind of boring. You have a boring teacher, but you make him sit down and listen to that boring teacher and learn that boring math because he knows he's going to need that boring math. Like, uh, hello, <laughs> redeem, make the best, make the best, make the best, Re remove some of the claims. Take some of the liens, which means you got to spend more time. There's certain things that you got to do. Uh, when I was in my 20s, I would go to the pawn shop, always take my 18-karat gold chain. I would hock it, put it in pawn. Once I put it in pawn, one of the things that they will always do is give me a redemption ticket. So when I came back, whether they knew my name, whether that person was there, if I was there or not, it didn't matter. I gave them my pawn ticket in order to buy back, to purchase back my 18-karat gold chain. If I didn't have my pawn ticket, then what they would do is ask me what the product was, what I brought in there, what was my name, and this is what they would do. Now they're going to charge me extra because I don't have my redemption ticket. Where are you going? We've got to stop leaving our young people in the pawn shop. We've got to stop leaving them there. We've got to stop losing our ticket. Yeah, you can pawn them when it comes to education because they, they, that's a lean on them. We can pawn them sometimes in sport because they need that discipline. But if we pawn them, if we leverage and mortgage their lives so much until there is no place for God, we have failed to redeem the time. 